Uh, my name is Brian Williams. If you don't know me, I'm the Young Adults Pastor here at Calvary. I am glad that you're here tonight. Hey, everybody, I got every, the, does everybody have one of these? Maybe? If you don't, you might be sitting on it. Uh, so, what's this all about? Uh, tonight, we're starting uh, a series called The Danger of Blessings. And that's maybe interesting to some of you, you're like the danger of blessings. We'll get into it. But what this is, this is an, uh, a series, a sermon series over the next six weeks that we as a church are going through. Not just here in YA, YA, but every aspect of our church. Every fall we do this thing where we call it the all church series. Basically, everybody from like the tiny, they do it with the babies, like actually babies, I think. I'm looking at Sarah because like Mary Roberts, if you don't know Mary, is like the sweetest lady and she just like cares for the babies and she, she teaches them the same things we're going through, but in like baby words. I don't know what they are, otherwise I'd share them with you. Um, anyway. So the whole church, we're going through it. So we're going to be going through this over the next six weeks. It's also going to be a part of small groups. And this book, uh, it's got it all. It's got everything going on in here. So if you open it up, you'll see there's a nice little letter from Pastor Sean, the senior pastor here at Calvary. I I recommend reading that. Um, He's pretty good with words. Uh, Then uh, you have this page. You might see it. It's page six. Page six kind of walks you through how to use the book, what, what all's in here. And basically, as you go through, you'll see that there's uh, what we call take five. And so that's a, a daily devotion, kind of take five minutes and, and read a scripture. And then there's some prompts on sort of things to contemplate and to spend time asking the Lord to search your heart in related to that scripture. So that's in here. Um, if you keep going, there's on page 14, there's a bunch of blank space for all the really great things you're going to take notes on tonight, um, Lord willing. Uh, then if you keep going, there's uh, a whole section for small groups. So if you're in small groups, anybody in here in small groups? <laughs> yeah. Um, bring this to small groups. Make sure you bring it with you because it's actually what we're going to be going through. There's uh, the curriculum for small groups, the things we're going to be talking about, the questions, they're all in here. So hold on to this book. Don't lose it. Bring it on Thursdays even if you're a note taker. Um, Even if you're not a note taker, bring it on Thursdays. (laughs) I feel like I should say that. Don't lose it. Whatever. Um, Anyway, hold on to that book. If you need extras or next week, uh, if you come with somebody who doesn't have one, we'll have more available. Uh, Make sure we want to make sure they get in the hands, everybody's hands. All right, so the danger of blessings. Does that sound weird to anyone? No, Hunter's like, no, blessings, man, dangerous, so dangerous. We all have blessings in our life. You know, we all have objects or talents, abilities, relationships, knowledge, opportunities. Uh, Blessings are good gifts from God. Blessings are a good thing. We're not to detest them. We're not to shun them or get rid of them. Blessings are meant to be enjoyed and delighted in. God gives them to us for our own good. So how can there be danger in that? Well, the danger, the warning that Scripture gives us and that we're going to be talking about over the next uh, six weeks is uh, about misusing the blessings that God gives us or misunderstanding their role in our lives. While a blessing is a good thing, the blessing should never usurp the one who gave it. You know, in in James it says, every good and perfect gift comes from above. It comes from our Father in heaven. The danger is in elevating the blessing over the blesser, the gift over the giver. At the heart of all this is how we define success in life. And that's really what we're talking about tonight as we look at the wise and the foolish builder. See, our idea of success guides our decisions, it guides our thoughts, it guides our life, ultimately. You know, what are you pursuing in life above all else? It determines how we will use the blessings that we have been given. Uh, Those blessings, uh, they can have a great impact on us or on others for the advancement of the kingdom of God. And this is a poignant series for all of us. Anybody in here have like a 93 Toyota, like Celica with like, 300,000 miles, anything like that, where you're like, my car's barely running. 
Maybe you don't even own a car. You're like, dude, I would love to have that car. Any car would be wonderful. I think there's some people in this room who are maybe thinking like blessings. I'm not blessed. You don't know my life. But ultimately, you got one. You know, you're breathing today. We've been given blessings. You're here in this room tonight. Maybe you have a 93 Toyota Celica, 300,000 miles. That's a blessing. It's a blessing. This is a poignant series for all of us, not just for where we are now, but also for where God intends to take us, how God intends to use us. You know, we're going to look at all the different types of blessings we have and, and the intent that God has for those in our lives. And it's mostly going to be about warning, which we don't do a lot of that in here. We don't spend a lot of time like flashing caution tape. You know, you look at the design of this and it's like, oh, okay, okay. The whole intent is this is a warning series. It's, it's the, what these things are all about is warning us, stay on this path because there's dangers around you. There's dangers. I lost my spot. Yeah. Ah, oh, here at Calvary. So we're a blessed church. <laughs> the neat thing is that, that it's not just for you as individuals. It's not just for me as an individual. But this, this whole series, it comes at the right time. God prompted us into this on purpose, I think, because we're seeing growth around this whole church. Growth in the, in the depth of people's relationships and walk with God, but also growth numerically. Like just this room, if you were here a year ago, like this is a different place. There's growth happening here. God's blessing, his favor is upon this place. And so this is important for us as a church, not just as individuals, to recognize and heed the warnings of what is God, what, is, what should we do with the blessings he has for us? How are we using them? How are we thinking about them? Are we pursuing them? Are we taking them for granted or are we giving all the glory and honor to God and continuing to surrender them to him and let him do with him, do with them and with us as he wills? See, ultimately, God gives us blessings that we might enjoy them and that we might use them to advance his kingdom. Uh, tonight, uh, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 through 25. If you have your Bibles, you can open there. It's going to be on the screens, but it's also in this book on page 10. Uh, this is a parable. It's a parable that comes after, at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, all six weeks, we're going to be walking through a parable uh, that Jesus told. A parable is a story that communicates a spiritual truth through an earthly or a familiar context. You know, the meaning of these stories are not always explicit. Uh, Often Jesus would tell them, and then later on with the disciples, they'd be like, what did you mean by that? And he'd explain it to them. But usually in the context of the moment, it wasn't explicit. That doesn't mean that, that it couldn't be understood or it couldn't be seen, but that the deepest meaning needed to be discerned. It was intentionally veiled. This particular parable, um, it comes after the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, all the parables are in the context of a specific situation, whether that's uh, a question that was asked or a specific comment or, or a specific situation. They're not just standalone in thin air, nothing going on. They, they, ha they come out of a specific context. So this one comes out of the Sermon on the Mount, which if you haven't read the Sermon on the Mount, do it. Do it. The Sermon on the Mount is like probably one of the most impactful, meaningful discourses in all of human history. Like whether you believe in the Bible or care about Jesus at all, no matter what you think about it, probably nothing, no other discourse in history has had more impact on nations or societies or people than the Sermon on the Mount. What, what God did with the Sermon on the Mount, when Jesus... Uh, what Jesus said here has shaped nations, it shaped cultures. On that day, 2,000 years ago, Jesus was quite literally blowing minds with the things he was saying and how he was saying it. Uh, have any of you ever um, read scripture or heard a sermon or maybe you're talking with a counselor and they say something and you're just like, whoa. Like, and you don't really have any other response than just, 
whoa. It's like that truth, either with the authority it's spoken with or the reality of the truth, probably both, that it just like splits you open and you're just like pierced. That's what happened to these people. These people are standing there. They just heard the Sermon on the Mount and really all they can do is just be like, whoa, man. So that's where we pick up in Matthew chapter 7. We're going to start in verse 24. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall, because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house. And it fell with a great crash. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he had taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. And this is where we see that people are like, what? Whoa. It's not just what he was saying, but it's how he was saying it. Now, we could spend a whole lot of time on these two verses, these last two verses, verses 28 and 29. But we're going to jump right back to the top. Basically, just take home and know that what Jesus said, how he was saying it, was different. It was piercing hearts. It was rocking people's worlds. Their minds were blown. And then he hits them with this. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man. Jesus has just said all this amazing stuff. And he's like, you've heard what I said. I'm revealing reality to you. You Don't just listen to these things, but respond to them. Don't just hear what I'm saying, but do it. For if you do, you will be like a wise man who built his house upon the rock. As we go through this verse, or this passage, the I was having trouble trying to figure out how to walk through it, so I made this chart. Basically, you got two people, right? You got like the wise person, and then you have the foolish person. Both of them hear the words of Christ. One puts them into practice. The other doesn't put them into practice. We're comparing two men here. Two have heard. One goes from listening to doing. The other goes from listening and then goes no further. Ends there. One goes from listening to doing. The other listens but goes no further. Tonight as we walk through this, the question that I want you to keep asking yourself is, are you hearing and doing or are you just hearing? Jesus wants more for us. He doesn't just say these things that we would hear them and agree with them. He wants them to go down and shape our lives, how we live, how we walk, how we think, how we talk, how we interact with people. You know, we, we've all heard, you're here tonight. We live in the United States. You're, there's no one threatening you on being here. It's easy to get here, I hope, unless there are a bunch of red lights or something. That kind of sucks. But you made it. There's no threat of violence. We have abundant access to the scriptures, even in apps on our phone. We all have the opportunity for accountability from the Holy Spirit. We all have the opportunity and the chance to hear from God. And as we move through this series, and even tonight, you got to ask yourself, what am I doing with what God has revealed to me? Are we putting it into practice? A, A regular question for many of us, I think for many of you in the room, for people I've talked with, I know for me and for most of humanity, of those who follow Jesus, A question we often ask is, what is God telling me to do? What does God want me to do? What does he want me to be doing? I just want him to speak to me. I just want him to tell tell me this or that. I just want him to tell me, like, go this way, Brian, do this. And the thing that we need to ask ourselves, the first place to start when we, if you are asking that question yourself or desiring that, is what has he already told you to do? Look at what he's already shown you. Look at what he's already spoken to you. Are you doing that? Often we come, I I say this out of my own life, how many times I've come before the Lord and said, calling for a new revelation. 
Lord, show me, show me, show me. But if we're calling for a new revelation when we're ignoring the last one, we're just being fools. That's what Jesus is calling out. Do what I have spoken to you about. Do what I've revealed to you. So we've got two men. One hears the word of God, hears Jesus, and and puts it into practice. The other hears him and does not put it into practice. And, And Jesus continues by saying, what you do, and Jesus continues by saying, what you do with what he says is like the person who builds a house. One builds a house on the rock and the other on the sand. They hear the word of Christ. One puts them into practice, one doesn't. They're like a person who's building a house, one who's built their house on the rock and one who's built their house on the sand. So both men had the opportunity to build a house. Both had the opportunity for success. Both were able to complete their houses. And at first we might not recognize any difference between them. They both built the houses. You know, maybe they both had like white trim and red shutters and a sweet hot tub in the back. First century, probably not. But they both looked the same. Maybe they both had like a donkey and like two sheep. Uh, They both built houses. Both were successful. And this may lead us to ask if we were there at that time, that first thought, how is one man foolish and the other wise then? They both looked successful. But ultimately... What we perceive as success or what others see as success may not actually be success. What we perceive as success or what others see as success may not actually be success. I don't think any of you would argue with me in here that we live in a culture and a society that is constantly trying to present itself as successful. We're trying to look perfect. We're trying to present ourselves in ways others will admire Even in our brokenness, we're trying to present it in ways that people would be like, wow, that's really great of them. How bold. Right? We're always trying to present ourselves in ways that others would find appealing or others would commend us for. We're trying to look successful. It's all swirling around this idea. And and we present what others, what we think others will view as successful. And none of it's new. None of this is new. It's a testament to the timelessness of the scriptures that the heart of humanity looks all the same. It looks all the same. When you pull back the curtains, when you remove the window dressing, no matter the time or location, every man, woman, or child that currently walks this earth or who has ever walked this earth has the same need. Every person has brokenness, pain, loneliness, longings in their life all of which is met and fulfilled in the person and work of Jesus Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection. When you peel away all the deficiencies, deficiencies, wrong word, autocorrect. (laughs) If it's in front of me, I'm going to read it. When you peel away all the differences, You know when that red line's there and you're just like, oh, uh, yeah, and the top, the first one, okay, anyway. When you peel back all the differences, <laughs> there's really, there's really no, there's no difference. The, it looks strikingly similar. My heart, the needs I have, the pain I have, the longings I have, it's, it's remarkably similar to the Sudanese refugee or a first century Jew. If we pull away what makes us look different to the rest of the world, what we think makes us so great, the things we use to basically like put makeup on our lives, if we peel that away to just who we really are, we're all dealing with the same stuff. It's no different than the person across the world who doesn't even have shoes. The desires, the longings of their heart, their brokenness, it's the same thing that mine is. The stuff isn't new. We see two men who each build a house. And at first glance, it may not be noticeable, but these two houses have very different endings. 
They both present themselves as successful and may be lauded by others as successful, but ultimately only, only one of them actually is. One is built on sand and the other on the rock. If you're like an architect or geologist or anything like that, like you know the difference, that like the stability of a foundation dictates the stability of a house. If you have a stable foundation, you have a stable house. If you don't have a stable foundation, that house is going to fall. Like we have earthquakes in California. In, uh, here, here's a funny one. If you were alive in 1994, raise your hand. All right. <laughs> So in 1994, there was uh, an earthquake here. It's probably the last big one we've had in this region um, called the Northridge earthquake. And during that time, there were houses that had major damage. There were houses, there were building, whole buildings that collapsed. And they would like collapse and like just a couple blocks away, there'd be another house that maybe looked strikingly similar and wasn't damaged at all. So much of that had to do with what their foundation was on. If that foundation was, was on rock, if it was on stable ground, solid ground, the house may have trembled, but it didn't fall. It wasn't even damaged. And there's other houses that were maybe on fill, where they like pile in a bunch of dirt. and they, Anyway, it was on fill, loose dirt, basically sand. And when that earthquake hit, those houses crumbled or were condemned because as that earth shook, their foundation cracked. And once that happened, the house was done for. We all have a foundation. No matter what that house looks like right now, eventually that foundation will be shown for what it is. We all have a foundation. And no matter what your life looks like right now, no matter what the house is that you've built upon, whatever foundation you have, eventually that foundation that's beneath all that will be seen for what it is. It continues here that the rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house. See, both houses were beat up and confronted with a storm. Very directly, we can connect this to the storms of life. Now, Brian Howard has been up on this stage multiple times and pointed out that, that we must recognize that the storms of life come upon the Christian and the non-Christian alike. There's brokenness, there's sin in this world doesn't matter if we do what's right. It doesn't matter if we follow Jesus wholeheartedly. That's not the secret to a problem-free, storm-free life. We're all going to face storms because it's a broken world, because it's a sinful world. What Jesus points out here is that when the storm comes, the difference between the wise man and the foolish man, the difference between the one who chased success that was not defined by Christ and the one who let Christ define his life when the storms came, the two were shown for what they really were. Both men built a house that from the outside may not have looked any different. At first, both looked successful. Each of us have a life, but just having the life is not true success. For eventually the storms will come, the tests will come, the ultimate of which is judgment day when we stand before God and give account of our lives. The storms of life are going to come, whether it's on judgment day or when you get that diagnosis or when that job falls through or when she breaks up with you. Foundations are revealed when things get hard. We're warned here that it's not about having a house. It's not about having a life but having a house, having a life that will stand. Doing it my way will catch up with you. And when it does, you're going to be sorry. This is a warning to all of us. You can put lipstick on a pig, but it's still a pig. It's still a pig. Your life may look great, but is it stable? If your life was a house... You may make it look and feel totally awesome with just the right, like, feng shui or whatever. But if the foundation is unstable, no one would want to buy it. No one would want to live there. It's just a matter of time before it falls. Is that your life? On judgment day, that foundation will be inspected and seen for what it is. When that storm comes, that foundation will be tested and seen for what it is. Um, so earlier this week, on Saturday actually, uh, it's 
I went to the grocery store. And it had been a long week last week. And this week, looking ahead, I was seeing all that needed to be done. and Just feeling like it was a lot. I have a six-month-old son, and he's fantastic. And he laughs a lot, and he giggles, and he loves me, which is great. When I come in the room, he, like, smiles and giggles, and I'm like, oh, yeah, hey. Hi, Isaac. I love you, too. It's wonderful. But he also is super tiring. He's super tiring. And so last week, like, my wife works full time. And so Fridays, I usually have Isaac all day so that she can try and get work done. And uh, I had him all day Friday. And it was a pretty long day with Isaac. We had a lot of fun, but also it was pretty tiring. And then Saturday morning comes, and he woke up super early. And so I took Isaac again, and we had him. And I'm just like super tired. I'm looking ahead going, oh my gosh, there's so much to do. How am I going to get it all done? And then I'm like, dang it, I got to go to the grocery store because we don't have any food. (laughs) So I get in the car and I'm driving to the grocery store and I'm just like lamenting to myself like, oh gosh, why is this so terrible? Why is this so hard? (laughs) Right? Like I have a six-month-old son who's healthy I have a wife who I love and loves me and cares for me. I have a job that provides for these things. I can go to the store and buy food. I have a house. I have something to do that's meaningful and purposeful. I know the Lord Jesus. Like, there's so many things here that I could be thankful for. And yet, in that moment, I'm just thinking, why can't it be easier? I just want it to be easier. And as I was thinking that, as I pulled into the parking lot and I just, like, put the car in park and just sat there for a second... And I was like, why, why can't it be easier? It's like a tap on my shoulder as the Holy Spirit just whispered to me, but I have more in mind for your life than easy. As I sat and I thought about what, was I, what I was being told, I recognized the need to question what kind of life am I pursuing? At that moment, what, what kind of life am I actually desiring? How am I defining success in that moment? In that moment, I was realizing I was defining it as easy. That's what success looked like to me. That's what I was striving for and longing for. But God has something so much more, so much bigger in mind for me. So in a moment, we're going to look at like, you know, words that define our life. But this came up because I read this article and somebody, um, they wrote like, everybody needs to pick one word that defines their life. And it was a great article it, like, about what to pursue and all that. And then at the end, they said, and here's the word I picked for my life. And it was Prometheus. Prometheus. <laughs> right? Or Pormethean. Oh, man, I got it wrong. Pormethean. That just shows. <laughs> Pormethean. So first of all, I'm thinking, like, what? You're going to sit around a fire and be like, oh, yeah, what word defines your life? Promethean. And everybody in the room's like, oh. <laughs> yeah. Promethean. <laughs> right? I'm sorry if that's your word. I think it's funny. <laughs> As an adjective, it's boldly creative, defiant, audacious. Audacious. Audacious? <laughs> Thanks. I prepped a lot for this. <laughs> As a noun, it's a person who is boldly creative or defiantly original. (laughs) Defiantly original. Pormethean. (laughs) Maybe that's your word. I don't think it should be. (laughs) So, what word describes the life you're pursuing? Is it easy? Is it long? Are you just pursuing a long life? The longest one I can have? Maybe you're pursuing a life of renown, of being known. Or maybe it's a life that's just unchallenged, that nothing, nothing comes at you. Or maybe it's a life of conquering. How many people here maybe want to be that person who plants the flag at the top and then looks down at everybody else and goes, I told you so. <laughs> maybe that's the life you're pursuing. Ultimately, a life of true success, a life that's built upon the rock, will be Christ-like. Christ-like. Jesus tells us, the things I've told you, do them. The things Jesus did, do them. 
We want a life that's Christ-like. That will give us a solid foundation, a life that'll stand, that at the end when we stand before God, whether it's in death or in the storms, all of it we can say, Lord, you're good. That song, uh, In Christ Alone, it's just so beautiful. It's just, it's, it's theology just straight through. But this is who Christ is, the solid rock upon which we stand because of his death, burial, and resurrection, that he died for us. He did what we couldn't do for ourselves so that we could stand. The warning is that if you build your life on anything other than Christ, it will amount to nothing in the end. What we do with blessing will be dictated by the foundation we're building upon. As we move through this series, we need to all question first and foremost, what foundation are we building upon? Because what we do with blessings, the rest of the series, it's, it's important and it's going to be good, but you got to start here. Because the foundation you're building upon will dictate what you do with the blessings God has given you. The wise person will shape their idea of success according to the gospel, according to scripture, according to what Jesus says. And in so doing, they will build a life that withstands the test. If we don't do this, our life will not stand. It will not be sturdy when the storms come or when the blessings move along. It will fall with a great crash. Band, if you guys want to make your way back up. I want to uh, tell one last story. I've actually told it in here before, but uh, 10 something years ago, we had a family reunion on my dad's side. So my grandfather, and he, he was the eldest of seven kids. And uh, we got the whole family together. So my grandpa and all of his brothers and sisters, and then all of their kids, and then all the grandkids, and then there was even great grandkids within that bunch. And there's something like... Uh, 75, 80 people there. Um, on the last day of the family reunion, we uh, sat beside a lake and all came together and had church together as a family. It's one big family. There's a ton of people there I'd never met. And yet we're sitting here and, and uh, the, the patriarchs, my grandfather and all his brothers and sisters, um, they, they get up, and a part of the church service that was sort of, they all kind of worked on together was basically them getting up and talking about how they saw the life of Christ in my great-grandfather and great-grandmother and their parents. And hearing those stories, hearing about uh, the things that my great-grandfather and great-grandmother did and how they raised up their kids in the Lord. I don't know my great-grandparents. My brother met my great-grandfather once when my brother was like six months or something. I've never met him. I know his name. That's it. My son Isaac, he'll have no idea who they are. Not a clue. They're gone. They're gone. But the amazing thing is that the, we're sitting there, and, and the legacy is that these two people who, who came to know the Lord... They came to know the Lord and they came to honor him and serve him and they built their life upon the foundation that is Christ and the things he said. Here we were, a family, 70 strong. There were some who weren't there, but over 70 people and every person there knew the Lord. Every person there was gonna be going home to be with Jesus. It didn't mean it was easy. It didn't mean it was simple, but the legacy that they planted wasn't one that included their name but it was one that included Jesus' name. That's the life I want to live. A life where once I'm gone and forgotten, the work that I did, the life I lived, the blessing that God gave me of this life has an impact beyond me. That, that maybe Isaac and his great-grandchildren might come together and say, wow, look how great it is we all know the Lord, and I will have been long forgotten, but I will have played a role in that. Maybe there's someone in your life, whether it's future family or maybe it's just friends alongside you who you could play a role, not just in their life, but in the family that comes from them, the lives of all the people who come after them. We're called to build a life that matters, a life that's Christ-like. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for all you've done for us. Thank you that you came after us, Lord. 
even when we like played a game of tag and we're like running from you as if you're it, Lord, you, you kept chasing. <laughs> Keep chasing us, Lord. Don't give up on us. Lord, tonight I surrender myself in my life and I, I surrender this the rest of this evening, Lord, and say, Lord, would this evening be built upon what you say? Lord, take my life and do something great with it. Replace what parts of my foundation are broken or crumbling or rotten. Lord, come in and give me a solid foundation, a house that will stand, a life that will stand at the day I stand before you. It will not fall. Thank you, Lord. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen.